Everyone likes the Game Boy. Seriously, why wouldn't you? It's a little baby boy and it plays Tetris and Pokemon. Even in Japan, where I found some of the better retro deals, there's a notable exception for Game Boys, which are sometimes actually more expensive than in the West. So when I saw this faulty Game Boy Pocket nearby for cheap, my curiosity was piqued. I had to check it out. Especially because, what the hell is going on here? I don't know if that's a marker or some scrunched up bit of thread or some kind of alien creature or mold growing inside it. Whatever it is, we gotta do something about it. Apart from the screen though, this Game Boy is, for the most part, in surprisingly good condition. I say surprisingly because Game Boys usually belong to kids and kids aren't usually too concerned about keeping their toys in mint condition. By comparison, look at these other Game Boys I have. This SP is pretty scuffed and scratched. In fact, one of the scratches even forms a name. Or check out this other Game Boy Pocket I have, also pretty scuffed up. I actually bought this broken and cheap too, but the uh, fix was extremely simple. I posted a video on Patreon about it if you want to hear the story behind this thing. Anyways, while I'm pretty impressed about this Game Boy's overall physical condition, it's working condition... Yeah, it's another dead boy. And it's not the batteries, because they work perfectly fine in my other Game Boy. All I can say is, hopefully this one isn't filled with feces. Let's bust it open and see what's what. It's the usual story of proprietary tri-wing screws, but the Game Boy is otherwise a famously simple device, and there are really only a few pieces to it. Much like the outside, the board was clean and in pretty good condition. Seriously, this almost looks brand new. Even the front side is super clean, and this is where the buttons are, so this would be the primary entry point for any dirt and gunk. But there's really nothing. I wonder if this was one of those barely played consoles, or maybe someone's been in here before. Well, let's see if we can find out why this isn't turning on. Just to cover my bases, I jumped straight to the battery terminals and tested them with the multimeter. But no, this time they seem fine, and the board does seem to be getting power. Or at least, some power. The batteries were giving me a fairly normal looking 2.5ish volts, but something was off on the rest of the board. I couldn't really tell what. What I could tell definitively was that VDD was wrong. It's supposed to be 5 volts, stepped up from the batteries by this regulator in the corner. But instead, it was almost nothing. So the regulator was my first suspect. Since I have another working Game Boy Pocket that I can use as a reference, I decided to just take that one apart too and try to do kind of a jumpstart maneuver between the working one and the broken one. If I put the batteries in the working one, connect both VCCs and VDDs together in parallel, in theory, if the voltage regulator is the problem, this should completely bypass it by sharing the same working power source. Okay, the silver Game Boy is on, let's see if it'll power the green one. Hmm, no chime. The volume is all the way up, but it seems to still be dead. Just to check, I connected the screen, and yeah, still nothing. Not that we really know how functional the screen is yet. Checking the voltages, we are at least getting 5 volts on VDD now, but I guess it's not enough to give it life. I checked some Game Boy Pocket schematics put together by Gekio on GitHub. Having documentation is a great reference for a situation like this. Here we can see the power from the batteries goes pretty much directly to the power switch, which connects the rest of the board either to those batteries while it's on, or this drain resistor if the power is off. When the power goes to the switch, it goes to a point called SW1 VCC. When that power goes through the switch into the rest of the board, it's just VCC. But here's something interesting. On the board, SW1 VCC is getting power, the same 2.4-ish volts that we see coming straight out of the batteries. But VCC is getting a fraction of that, 0.45 volts and just kind of meandering around there. This would seem to indicate that the power switch itself is causing the problems, somehow only passing about a fifth of the power through. To confirm, I soldered this wire in, essentially hardwiring it to on. When I put the batteries in, No! No! <laughs> so yeah, we've confirmed the sole issue is just the power switch of all things. Let's see what it looks like with the screen connected. Wow, so the screen actually does work, despite whatever that crap is inside it. In fact, let's even try it with a game inserted. Okay, nice. Looking good. So what to do about this broken switch? My instinct was to just replace it. Surely someone's mass producing a replacement switch for this, right? Well, yes and no. What people are making is an adapter board that takes this standard switch part and fits it to the board of several Game Boys. I was a little skeptical because it didn't quite look the same. The switch looks a lot smaller, but maybe that's okay? It does say specifically that it should work, so I gave it a shot. Using some desoldering braid, I removed the old switch, which actually went fairly smoothly. I then cleaned off and prepared to attach the new switch. I lined it up on the board so that all the pads seemed to be in the right place, I even made sure this plastic bit would reach it, soldered it down, and... it didn't. 
literally not even a millimeter off. I thought I'd lined it up perfectly. I even thought I'd confirmed its position against the outer plastic, but it just barely doesn't make it. I did try another desoldering, but since this board had already just been through one, I was a little concerned about damage. This switch also attaches differently from the old one, making desoldering a lot more complicated. Eventually I decided to just leave it. I'd already singed some of the LCD connector and didn't want to risk any more damage, so I resoldered it and started thinking of ways I could salvage this one. In my defense, this switch piece is definitely smaller than the original. In fact, I think it's safe to say that is too small. I don't want to be shifting the blame here, but the fact that this is small enough to look like it all lines up but then not work, I think is a design flaw with this new switch. But regardless, it was time to figure out what to do about it. I brainstormed for a while, trying to figure out what my options were as far as either making the switch longer or modifying the plastic bit. What complicates this is it's actually off in two directions. It's not just short, it's also slightly too high. In pretty much any situation, even if it did reach, it would only just barely. And if you're wondering if it was supposed to mount upside down, I actually thought about that too, but it didn't really work. There was just no way it could have been soldered on like this. I'm pretty sure this is how it's supposed to mount, it just doesn't quite work. I wondered if this was actually designed for a Game Boy Color or Advance or something, but since I'd bought it, a review appeared saying it was also too short for the Game Boy Color. That sucks. So one night I was flossing my teeth. I'd bought a bunch of these easy floss things because I'm a little baby that can't floss properly. And I realized they all come with this plastic toothpick. And a section of it could be just the right size to extend the switch as long as it needs to be. So I went ahead and chopped one of them up. While this end is a little thin and flexible, further down is actually quite sturdy, and I think it could work. Lining it up, it certainly seems like it could. I trimmed it down further and further until it was just the right size. After some very finicky positioning with cardboard, everything was finally in place. I'm placing the extra piece underneath so that it can extend in both directions like I mentioned before. I'm using two-part epoxy again because it seemed to work last time. Very carefully, I dabbed it on. Once again, I was very nervous about overdoing it especially the glue getting into the switch and potentially gumming it up forever. It got a little close here, but I hoped it was fine and left it for 24 hours to dry. All right, a day later, let's test the switch. Okay, doesn't look too bad. Thankfully, the switch was still functional and I thought it would now be the perfect size, but yeah, the bit from the floss just fell right off. Plastic gluing is notoriously tough because different types of plastic require different chemistries to bond them. And while this glue is right for the switch's plastic, it's obviously not right for the floss. As expected, even though it's longer, without the extra bit underneath, the switch just slides past it. But I wasn't too worried because it's not like small bits of plastic are hard to find, so I could probably still glue something else in there. What was concerning was this. Yeah, okay. Clearly the switch really isn't designed to have these sorts of forces working on it. Inadvertently, I've turned it from a switch into a lever. Basically, what this means is there's nothing we can do here. Any attempt to lengthen the switch is just gonna do this. So, now what? As far as I can tell, we have two options. We could keep this switch and find some way to modify the plastic shell bit to reach further down. I was kind of trying to avoid this because I don't want to hack up Game Boy Pass just for the sake of a crappy switch, but there may be something we can do there. The other option is just find another switch. Something that, unfortunately, doesn't seem to exist. Basically all replacement switches I found were some variation on this design. Some with the PCB and some without. It is likely that without the PCB, it would be both lower and could be extended out further so that the plastic bit could catch, but we're definitely teetering into bodgy territory here. Once again, I brainstormed this for a while, but eventually I discovered something that I never knew about. The original switch could be taken apart. I sort of expected it to be some singular unit that just had to be replaced, but apparently that's not the case. You can disassemble the switch all the way down to its base components, so naturally a cleaning was in order. With some alcohol and a q-tip I got to work, and yeah look at that, this thing is filthy inside. After cleaning all the bits and putting it back together I tested it out with the multimeter, and it actually seems to be working. All the pins that should light up in each position are lighting up we might actually be able to restore the original switch if we could just get this new one off. I sat down with the switch once again, and with a lot of patience and a lot of flux, I got the new switch off. And the Game Boy came away 
Well, I guess I can't say unscathed, but I'm just thankful all the pads are still intact. I certainly don't want to have to put it through another desoldering, so for testing, I'm only going to solder in the pins that need to be soldered in. Alright, let's give it a test. Oh, that was a happy Game Boy noise. Let's try it with the screen. Oh, I need to adjust the contrast. There it is. Alright, so unexpectedly, I can now confidently solder the original Switch back in, and the Game Boy is now working perfectly. Well, wasn't that a bit of a mission? I'm pretty sure this is the first time I've replaced a part just to end up swapping the old one back in. After a little refurbishing, of course. I looked around at some other YouTube repairs, and that does seem to be what other, more knowledgeable people do too. You actually don't have to completely desolder the switch to clean it either. You can simply desolder the metal shield and lift it up, at which point you can just clean it out as we did before. Well, there's a Matt KC top tip for you. If you're thinking of replacing your Game Boy Switch, don't! At least until China starts mass-producing more appropriate switches, yeah, I'd recommend holding on to these original ones. Turns out they're not easy to come by. Now finally, what is up with this screen? Well, let's take a look. The screen is stuck in with essentially some mild adhesive. All you have to do is lightly twist the case and eventually it'll just pop out. Damn, I was kind of hoping this marking was just on the plastic lens or something. Nope, it's definitely within the screen. Like Ogres, LCD screens are made up of a bunch of layers, so it should be possible to take them apart and see once and for all what this stuff is. First I removed the frontmost polarizer layer. I won't pretend to know how optical elements work, all I know is this helps direct the light and is necessary to see what's on the screen. It's also possible for this layer to get sun damaged, and thankfully it can be replaced. Naturally, the adhesive for these is pretty damn strong, but with some effort it can be peeled off. It did leave behind some glue residue, but we can get that off with alcohol later. Now, what's funny is it looks like that did get rid of the mark, but it's a trick. Notice there isn't the mark on the polarizer either. You can actually see here what the polarizer does. Yep, the mark is still there, it's just the whole screen doesn't work without polarized light. This might give us a clue as to what's wrong. I'm aware these screens are twisted pneumatic screens which works by, I don't know, magic, but maybe this mark is indicative of some kind of damage to that mechanism? I cleaned off the glue with some alcohol and scrubbing, which took a very long time, this adhesive is no joke. I even tried some WD-40, which I've had good luck with before, but it had no real effect here. Eventually, with enough scrubbing, it was all clean. Funnily enough, you can still see the mark at some angles, but where it's coming from is still kind of a mystery to me. I tried peeling the layer on the other side, which is simply a reflective layer to help the outside light shine back into your eyes. I wasn't sure this would do anything, but felt it was worth a shot. Sometimes people remove this to install a backlight, but I just wanted to see if I could find that mark. Nope, just a lot more glue to clean off. At this point, I kind of feel like there's not much more to be done. These remaining layers feel pretty fused together. I don't think they'll be nearly as easy to take apart, and even if I could without breaking them, I'm not sure they can be put back together. I think we might simply have to call this screen dead. Luckily, that doesn't mean this Game Boy is dead. Thanks to the community, brand new screens with backlights and modern LCD technology are being mass-produced as we speak. And I actually bought one just in case this screen was unsalvageable. So check in for part 2 where I'll install the screen and finally turn this from junk into the ultimate Game Boy Pocket. If you have any theories on what this mark is or ideas for ways I could diagnose it in part 2, let me know in the comments down below. Until then, I'll see you all in the next video. Bye guys.